Bom dia a todos e todas. Uh, obrigado. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen and participants. Thank you for participating in this panel on state violence, militarized policing and mental health in Brazil. Before moving on, I would like to make a few observations and announcements regarding the translation. We have simultaneous translation in English and Portuguese. To access that translation, please click on the globe at the bottom of your Zoom screen and you can choose your language English or Portuguese to follow the meeting in whichever language you're more comfortable with. Is the English on the globe box and in it we can choose either English or uh, Portuguese. Como eu dizia, uh, obrigado a todos e todas por participarem do evento. Um, just confirming, um, Shoban, can you give me an okay if you hear the translation? Okay, perfect. So we are going to begin our panel, which is a partnership between the federal, the State University of, of Goiás, Minas Gerais, and the Ulster University in England. Brazil is a post-colonial country, which more recently in its history has become a constitutional democracy, a vibrant democracy, despite being very imperfect. Despite that, it's important to say that human rights have been regularly violated in the country. This is very much due to the fact that the, the structures in the country are still marked by social authoritarianism, reflecting inequality, exclusion, poverty, and many forms of violence. In this case, we're referring mainly to police violence. Police violence directed at vulnerable communities has always been part of the Brazilian state apparatus, but things have become more degraded over, ever since the parliamentary coup in 2016 and the increased neo-fascist uh, threats to Brazilians, Brazil's fragile democracy. It is a consensus that violence regarding stemming from militarized policing um, negatively affects the mental health of all populations involved. This happens due to the fact that we cannot have integral or holistic health without mental health. The right to integral health includes three levels of obligations, imposes three levels of obligation to the Brazilian state. The ob obligation to respect, to comply, and to obey. But the Brazilian state has been incapable of com fulfilling its tripod of responsibilities regarding mental health in the context of militarized policing, mainly when in relation to vulnerable communities in the country. This is a serious problem, which is should be the interest of academics, legislators, managers, defenders of human rights, and mainly the inhabitants of vulnerable communities and the favelas in Brazil, who have been consistently been victimized by militarized policing in their communities, as is the case of the Manguinhos community in Rio de Janeiro. The movie, Now I Want to Scream, Brazil, UK, 2020, touches on the, st the issues of militarized policing and the negative effects that militarized policing has on the inhabitants and dwellers of vulnerable communities and specifically favelas in Brazil. It is a very important film and directly related to the debates we will be developing today here. Let's go to a trailer. Alan, can you please play the trailer? Jonathan estaria completando 25 anos de idade se ele não tivesse sido assassinado com um tiro nas costas, disparado por um policial é, da polícia militar lotado aqui 
em Manguins, na UPP de Manguins, em 2014. Sem ter um chão para Foi quando o meu filho de 14 anos teve o direito dele à vida violado por parte de quem deveria proteger ele, que é o estado do Rio de Janeiro. Meu filho foi morto aos 14 anos com roupa e material de escola aqui no conjunto de favelas da Maré, pela CORE, a civil do Rio de Janeiro. A letalidade policial já é um fato no Brasil há muitos anos, mas o que nós temos visto nos últimos anos, sobretudo com a atuação de governos conservadores e governos que têm uma visão muito de visão contrária aos direitos humanos, é uma promoção de uma política de segurança pública letal, que visa a atingir, sobretudo, populações muito específicas, como as populações negras, é, jovens e pobres das periferias. Só teu de mais ninguém. O Estado do Rio de Janeiro mata cinco civis nessa lógica de confronto que ele está colocando por, por dia. O Estado é responsável, em média, por quase 40% dos homicídios, 30 e poucos por cento dos homicídios. Que amanhã, por amor, possas esquecer que quem manda... Jogou tudo na internet, eu tenho tudo guardado. Jogou eles na internet, assim, um monte de corpos. Quando eu abri, que eu vi aquilo assim, eu fiquei desorientada. Desmaiei, assim, me deram água com açúcar, eu, depois eu recuperei a... Né, recuperei assim, fiquei bem. E fui ver aquilo e fotos deles mortos assim, um jogar em cima do outro, embolado, embolado no chão. momento eu quero gritar, quero falar disso, quero falar da Ágata, porque eu gosto de falar dela, porque ela é meu orgulho e se eu pudesse chegar no, no último andar e gritar e falar dela, eu falaria, entendeu? Eu falaria, porque ela era uma menina inacreditável, eu falaria dela, eu gritaria, por isso que eu venho aqui e falo sim. O presente painel de uh, discussão objetiva. Our panel today aims at discussing state violence, militarized policing, and mental health in Brazil. We have invited to discuss these subjects the following speakers, and I would like to enthusiastically thank them for having accepted this invitation to be a part of the conversations. So we are inviting Monique Cruz, the coordinator of institutional violence and, and security of global justice, Professor Shoban Wills, Willis, um, director of the Transition of Justice Institute at Ulster University in the UK, and co-director of the film Now I Want to Scream and Ana Paula Oliveira, defender of human rights and one of the leaders of the Mães de Manguinhos movement in Rio de Janeiro. We will begin our conversation today listening to Professor Wills. Each speaker will have 15 minutes for their opening words. Oh, actually, Monique Cruz will be the first one. I'm sorry, correcting that. Monique, please. The floor is with you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Good morning to all of those listening to us from different places in the world. I want to start by, first of all, thanking you for the invitation in global justice. Or, is, um, I'm. I just want to correct that I am not a coordinator, but I am a researcher in the team researching the subject of state violence. I want to say it's an honor to be here, sitting with Ana Paula, who, besides being a colleague in our battle for justice she's also a researcher and we are uh, we're both born in favelas in rio de janeiro and it's an honor for me to be speaking with her here i made a brief presentation i think laura is already putting it up on the screen getting my slides up on the screen alan alan's getting them up on the screen thank you alan for putting these slides up i'll try to be brief we don't have much time but i do want to say that 
we're going through a very particular moment in Rio de Janeiro where we're undergoing or reliving a series of, I, I would call it oba oba, I don't know how this will be translated, but it basically means the expression oba oba um, um, means that we're, we're going through a very complex moment of public security. Uh, this is a moment which is uh, coming as a government policy during a moment of elections and which carries a series of symbolic violences that affect us directly. I believe Ana Paula will probably speak about this, about the hardships and how hard it is for women who have lost their children, who have had their children taken from them to undergo this moment. I am Moniki Cruz. I am a researcher at Global Justice or Justicia Global. I am also working on my studying and conducting my PhD and participating in a research group in Rio de Janeiro at the state at the federal university. It's a group which researches mediating conflicts in public space. So my academic history has been working on this subject for quite some time. Uh, also in my partnership with the Justicia Global, which has been acting in Brazil on the subject for over 22 years now. Alan, please, next slide. So to start, I would like to bring some bring up some basic premises. When we talk about state violence and militarized policing in Brazil, we're basically talking about death. Um, we have initiatives that are um, very specific and that deal with the effects of these violent policies. We have the SUS, the Unified Public Health Care System, which has a very well-structured system but does not receive the necessary resources, financial resources, as well as human resources to ensure that this policy can in fact be structured and reach the needs that, these, that the system imposes. So I brought these basic premises up so I could state that we're talking about death policies, which it's important that you understand about the photo that's up on the screen, for example, that this is not cannot be summarized only to police violence. There are other issues involved. So there are communities which are policed very brutally. And there are also cases where basic sanitation, where quality education doesn't reach these communities. These are also violent policies of death where the public health care system precariously reaches these communities. So when we talk about policies of death, we're talking about armed violence and we're also talking about uh, other policies which also promote high death tolls in these communities. So policies of death are also reflected in the way um, revenue is divided unequally and uh, the life expectation is lower. These policies of death cannot be summarized to the police agents or to the hospital where a woman of color is not doesn't receive enough, enough anesthesia, where she suffers violence during birth, um, where black uh, children of color are also uh, die at birth at higher rates than other children. So we cannot summarize this only to the executors of the policy. We live in a country which produces policies of death at the moment of creating public policy and as well as when that policy becomes material in people's lives. Another issue we hear repeatedly from researchers is about public policy and police policy as incorrect but they are not incorrect. Militarized policy and death policy is not incorrect. It's historical and it's part of the basis of the country as a state and as a nation. This policy is also sustained by ideologies which are elaborated and executed by cis heteronormative white men. What I am saying when I say this is that the people creating this policy in Brazil are white men, white men that are in the spaces of power and that are reproducing these policies which maintain colonialized violence, violence which is directed to the other, to the other, the one who is not the white man, who is not the business owner or land owner, and the other which in this context also we can understand 
race is also part of the hierarchy of the value of life and where these men decide which are the lives that will be protected, which are the lives that will be ignored and how policy will work in favor of that. It's important to remember that these policies and militarized violence is a logic of modernity. So when we talk about colonialization, we're talking about militarized processes and and neo-military processes, neo-militarized processes. Next slide, please, Alan. <clears throat> so here I share with you a brief timeline with some very important historical marks. I, I decided to include these marks, but we know that there are many other important historical moments in this, the history of this. So pre and post abolition si signalize a process of poverty being the target of public safety, of public security. So public security, which shows up in the Constitution as a right of all, but which is executed in a very selective, directed manner, determining which are the territories and which are the people that will be <clears throat> protected and while and which are the people which will be victimized. So if you have a population which is very victimized by public policy, you have another part of the population that needs to be that needs to feel protected by this policy. So I brought up a few legislative um, marks which show some of the laws that impact reality today. So when we think about the 18th century, for example, when the idea of the quilombos was conceptualized, it, 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 it talks about every habitation of people of color that are over five people in that household. So having people, uh, black people united in households at that time would configure a quilombo, which at the time was very criminalized. The quilombos were very criminalized and five black people together already constituted a quilombo. Here in Brazil, you'll see, you'll find spaces where this is also um, maintained by other ideolo ideologies. And then in 1847, we see the that this law is transformed in a law which says that quilombo can be defined as a slave which is on the run or in um, uh, where there are one or two slaves together. So you can see here that we have a criminal that things become more severe criminal, criminally. Then we have the, the Constitution of 1824, which abolishes cruel treatment, but we see that the people of color and African descended population continue to be criminalized. And then in 1832, we have the code of, uh, which prohibits the use of marijuana, use and sale of marijuana in 1832. This was always directed at Afro-descendant populations, which were the population using those plants at the time. So we see the prohibition and the criminalization, but the plants, marijuana, are called pitu do pango or African poison. So always very much associated to the Afro-descendant population and the enslaved population. Then in 1835, we see the implementation of a law which punishes um, any act by an enslaved person that conflicts with their law, the proprietors. So then in 1850, we see the law of land, which made it more difficult for people to access or purchase land. So today we have a very severe problem in Brazil, which is concentration of land in few hands and the concentration of wealth in few hands, which ends up directly impl implicating racial equality. Then in 1888, we have abolition and abolition, which did not come along with reparation or with any means of payment or reparation for the generation upon generation that were enslaved. In 1890, then we see the criminal code. And then in 1940, another criminal code. And then 1941, we see the Lei da Vagiagem, or the law of vandals. So anybody walking on the street, which could not prove that they were employed, could be also arrested. And we see this happening every day today, where young, uh, people of color are taught by their parents that they should walk around with their documents so they can prove who they are, they can prove that they're employed or prove that, prove their identity. 
So my companion work, walks with his um, labor documents in his pocket until today because that's what he learned from his mother, that he needs to prove that he is a worker to not be arrested. And then in, 19, in 1971 to 2006, we have the drug laws in Brazil, laws which are responsible for the high uh, incarceration, the high level of women of color who are incarcerated. Ulysses, I, I don't know how my time is doing, so if you can keep me um, on time, please, and let me know how much time I have. Here in this slide, I brought a text, which I would probably take some time reading, but I think is very important uh, considering the time that we're the, the current historical period in Rio. We are, we see the public policies of security are always implemented based on external demands. So populations of favelas in the periphery in Brazil are never consulted about the policies of security that they want to have or that they should have. Ulysses, do you want to speak to me? No? All right then. So I'll go ahead and I want to read this text. It'll take a few minutes, but it's a text from 1914 produced by a a Brazilian intellectual known as Lima Barreto. He says, the newspapers tell us that a police <clears throat> deputy inspecting some police stations found flies and police agents asleep. They say that this police uh, deputy took objects and the newspapers with their praiseable good sense took the opportunity to strengthen their complaints about the lack of policing in suburbs. I always read these complaints and become shocked. I have lived in the suburbs for many times and I usually go home late at night. Once in a while, I find a police agent or security agent and very few times does anyone tell me about crimes in the streets that I cross to reach my home. The impression that I have is that the life and the property in those areas do not actually demand a expensive um, apparatus of police security. Everybody understands each other well in those places and the, the state does not need to interfere to make public property or pri private property respected. I would think that if things were not this way, then police agents would find ways to make arrests and people going home late at night like myself or the poor people living there would be disturbed for no reason or for no making no impact on the security. Suburban policemen should continue sleeping. They have recently understood that the, the population has recently understood that the police are useless, thankfully. So this text basically summarizes feelings about an elite in the country that needs to feel protected, but also considers that thousands, millions of people were in enslaved and brought to Brazil. Many of their families worked in as slaves, then were placed in the cities to urbanize and build the cities with no reparation and under a process of criminalization, including a mass production of laws and criminali criminalizing laws to criminalize this population. So we're discussing here public policy that comes, uh, that is part of a federal constitution, uh, the state constitution, which is promoted through the production of violence and the control of population, which was left abandoned for centuries and responsible for taking care of themselves. I'll go over the next slide. So Alan, please, next slide. This is a brief um, news clipping from a newspaper saying that in 1981, the city of Rio de Janeiro was already using helicopters, armed helicopters, uh, uh, flying over Manguinhos. In Manguinhos, a house was completely uh, gunned down. Three people were murdered because of a chase, a, a, a police chase of robbers. So these are examples of things that we have lived in the far past. Another thing I would like to mention in the next slide, please, is I won't go over all the scenarios, but I wanted to go over some of the way social movements have produced knowledge, mainly social movements led by black women who are fighting for justice, memory, truth, and freedom have been contributing to this scenario over time. So the democratic state of right, the mothers of Manji Mayu describe this in a book where they talk about the 90s, they, they used to call the 90s at the time. So if we think that our d democratic state of, of law has a judicial mark from 1988, um, they, call the, they call the 90s the era of manslaughter. We have episodes where 
that are documented as secular practices in Rio de Janeiro, situations of deaths and murders, of mass murders of young people of color. And here you can see some of the, a list of the most well-known um, murders and manslaughters in favelas and in prisons in Rio de Janeiro. The most recent one in Rio de Janeiro, which was very, became very famous was a slaughter in Salgueiro in Rio de Janeiro where nine people were murdered a few months late after the slaughter where 26 people were murdered in the favela of Jacarezinho. Besides this, in the favela of Nova Brasilia, in the north region of Rio de Janeiro, in 94 and 95, we saw two very um, disturbing slaughters with rapes involved, which generated a condemnation for Brazil in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, International Court of Human Rights. Next slide, please. So here, I also want to share with you some important points that help us to think of the relation between armed state armed violence or violence that is produced with the approval of the state um, which have generated important impacts on mental health a permanent state of exception so we have processes where favelas or regions inhabited by the people of color are maintained in a state of exception where rights are suspended not only by state agents but private agents of security we also have the logic of territorial occupation and invasion the systematic violation of the right to life not only by direct murders and slaughters but also other issues which do not allow these populations to develop correctly or functionally we do not have the right to property the right to come and go or presumption of innocence so we're talking about a permanent state of suspension of rights in these territories this generates mental health issues um, disease and death so and resistance resistance in these locations uh, we can also see that the landscapes of these locations demonstrate violence. I mean, imagine that most people here have already seen houses that have been gunned down or houses with bullet holes in them. This is an image which is very painful to us, but it was a case which we saw take place in Manguinhos. A young man, João Batista, was murdered with a shot to his head, standing at his window and the blood remained on the wall for quite some time. And this type of image shows how diseased these communities have become and how disturbing these is these issues are we walk through our communities we pass by these places and we remember this because of the scars that are maintained in our territory in our landscape i'm trying to to move quickly here but i think i'm, I'm getting to the end of my slides um here you we we, we discussed this a little bit Ter state terrorism which is uh, what the social movements are naming these practices so we can reflect on them. It's very explicit and we would have many complexities that we could go over here. But I want to bring two points specifically, the dual nature of this. So uh, while we have white men creating and executing public policy of death, then we have racial racialized women. So I'm talking about indigenous women a black women, gypsy women, who have been organizing themselves and resisting to the cruelest face of Brazilian democracy, which is the production of death as a part or as a structure in this democratic state. So death is not an exception in the Brazilian democracy. It constitutes the basis of how this country's democracy was built. Next slide, please. To close here, I brought a paragraph by Jurema Bernanke. She is today the Jurema Bernanke is writes this in a book called Moching or Mutiny, where she says deaths that result are real, painful and traumatic. Many deaths. They are many unjust, unacceptable, even though they are incapable of creating a complete holocaust of the black population hunger race environmental racism the violation of human rights and the right to health the uh, and structural violence produce more deaths of women trans people um, black men adults young people gays lesbians children and unproportionately the people of color before and side by side death are uh, uh, inhabits an intense suffering and sensation of inadequation and unconformity, a lack of perspective, total sadness and solitude. 
This is a picture that I took in Grota in the Complexo do Alemão in 2018 when we see the Brazilian army once again putting their war tanks on the streets to demonstrate their military power. Next slide, please. The next slide is my closing slide, and this image actually circled the world. It became a commercial, I think, for some time during the Olympics of 2016. It was a picture which was taken at Mein Manguinhos in 2013 after the murder of Roberto Plino, Fino, uh, son of Fatima, who is one of the leaders of the Mein Manguinhos movement working with Ana Paula. And I also brought the lyrics from a rap song from Gina G. She was a singer and poet where she says, they talk about peace, but in their hearts, they set up a trap. I can feel the, the dangers of a war that is not declared. It is a cold, cold war. It disputes violence, blood, a bloody war. But we know it goes from bad to worse. We're living the last days, the final days. It's difficult to manage, difficult to breathe, difficult not to let the evils of the world make me bitter. It is difficult to free ourselves from the handcuffs of the demon, the god of the system, which hunts someone to devour. I want to close my brief presentation by greeting the mothers of the people who are the incarcerated population in the country, people who are dying of hunger, people who are being murdered by the state with um, no visitation rights, no right to food, and people that are also dying because of um, the incapacity or being prohibited from even their, their time in the sun. So I'm sorry for going a few minutes over time. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and now I will pass the word to Professor Siobhan Wills, who will, uh, from Ulster University. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the Federal University of Goas, uh, my co-presenters, Anna Paula Oliveira, Monica Cruz, Ulysses Tertoneto, and also Clara Connolly um, for her wonderful translation, and Alan Maban for hosting, doing the technical hosting of this. Thank you all for this opportunity to address you. Ulysses and I have been working together for some time now, researching the impact of police violence in Rio on human rights. And as part of this project, we produced the film Right Now I Want to Scream, and Ulysses showed you the trailer. We produced that film in collaboration with some of the residents of Rio's favelas. And Anna Paula was one of the people that we spoke to and who has inspired the work that we're doing now. Because I have, I was very impressed by her courage and by how she and her colleagues are transforming uh, the campaign for human rights in Rio and in Brazil more generally. Um, I, I won't go into the detail of the scale of the violence because uh, Monica uh, Cruz has gone into that. Um, one of the things that I've um, that I learned from being in Rio, um, and I had been in Haiti before. I've worked um, in City Soleil, dealing with uh, police violence in City Soleil and violence by UN peacekeeping officers. So I'm, I wasn't new to violence. Well, one of the things I learned from being in Rio was one, the scale and length of the operations, which could last four or five days for a single operation, but also that the scale of violations of human rights goes beyond what is being reported in the papers and goes beyond what is being reported in human rights reports and in legal cases. Most of those focus on deaths and injuries, naturally because deaths and injuries are as is obvious, the most serious and most deadly of those human rights violations. But it became clear to me from being there um, that the scale of violations is much more pervasive. And that although deaths are a huge and tragic part of it, the layers and layers of consequences of the scale of the operation extend far more broadly than that. And they are not being addressed, which is one reason I want to highlight them here because I think it's important to address some of those broader rights. But before I go into the detail of what I want to talk about, which is mainly the right to mental health, I just want to address a point that the, the usual argument put forward by state uh, for the heavily militarized policing is that these operations are necessary in order to control gang violence. 
and that aside from a few rogue officers, operations are normally conducted in accordance with international standards. And it seems to me very clear that this is not the case. And it, even amongst the police, uh, there is a recognition that this is not the case. Um, as part of the film right now, I want to screen, we interviewed a police officer, Janina Ma Janaina, sorry, my pronunciation's probably off, Janaina Matos, who told us that it has become normal for police to enter a territory and treat a population as if it were a war enemy. And she said, Brazil's security policy is not aiming to guarantee security for everyone, but just for an elite, an elite while oppressing the black people. Um, and just in furtherance of that um, critique of the police's approach, I want to play you a one minute clip from General Heleno speaking about his approach to policing in the favelas. Helena, as many of you will know, is Minister for Institutional Security in Brazil. He was also the first UN commander of peacekeeping mission in Haiti, MINUSTA, and that was also characterized by extreme violence towards margin, the marginalized communities in Haiti. And that was uh, the original beginning of the making of the film right now I want to scream, was looking at that link between the operations in City Soleil on operations in Rio de Janeiro. But of course, the research has expanded beyond that now. Um, Alain, would you please play the clip? A nossa regra de engajamento no Haiti era uma regra de engajamento altamente flexível, que dava ao comandante da cena, não era o comandante geral, comandante da cena onde estava acontecendo aquilo, o poder de ferir e chegar a, ao ferimento letal daquele sujeito que tivesse ato ou intenção hostil, ou seja, um sujeito armado de fuzil, assaltando, roubando carga, ele passa a ser um alvo. E a partir daí eu posso eliminá-lo. E quem é, fizer essa ação está isento de responsabilidade jurídica. Essa é a segurança jurídica que nós temos brigado muito. Melhorou com a história de ser julgado no, na justiça militar. Thank you, Alan. In that clip, Heleno said that when he was in command of UN peacekeeping forces in Haiti, he believed that the UN rules of engagement permitted UN troops to eliminate any armed person that the UN officer thinks is about to engage in potentially hostile activities. And he gives us an example, stealing goods. And he's also advocating applying a similar approach in the favelas, that the police should be able to eliminate someone that it has a weapon if they are stealing goods. Brazil does not have the death penalty. You cannot lawfully shoot to kill in order to stop a person from stealing. Even in wartime, that wouldn't be lawful. Neither human rights law nor the law of armed conflict permit police or troops to kill someone because they are stealing. In peacetime, the only legal justification for intentionally killing someone is if it's the only way to protect a life that is being threatened. I, the, the, that, that is so distressing that um, I, I think it's very clear that there is uh, an issue there with police going into uh, communities, uh, treating uh, the population there as if they were a war enemy, and with the Minister for Institutional Security arguing that he has uh, the right to eliminate people, eliminate, because uh, they are stealing. But I want to focus on a broader scale of the human rights that are being violated. Um, and the reason I want to do so is because it is being underreported. And I think if there was more focus on it, it could, it, it could shift the way uh, that uh, reparations and the obligations of the state are being addressed. And that is the fo a, fo uh, a greater focus on the right to mental health. P police violence causes debilitating distress across the whole community, especially to the families of people who are being killed, but also to people who families where there has been no direct death and even to families that have not actually witnessed face to face a death. Children suffer post-traumatic stress disorder from hide, having to hide under desk during police operations. Um, they can hear shots outside. They, they may not be killed themselves and their family may not be killed. Uh, no one in their family, but they still experience distress. They are frightened because they hear 
uh, on the news that children are being killed. They lose out on their education because school days are being lost, schools are closed for many, many days during operations. And their parents are anxious too. They suffer anxiety, wondering whether their children are safe. And their whole family is fragmented by this distress because obviously uh, if there is a, a death in the family, uh, a mother will be distraught, maybe finding it difficult to manage emotionally and all of the other children will be affected as well as uh, uncles, brothers, the whole community. In 2020, the Department of Health and Violence Studies at Fia Cruz reported that militarized policing is a leading causal factor in the high levels of depression, anxiety, nervousness, post-traumatic stress disorders such as nightmares, hypervigilance, flashback, emotional anesthesia, and emotional for social life seen amongst residents of Rio's favelas. And Tanya Collar, who's a psycho psychoanalyst at Brazil's National Observatory on Mental Health, Justice and Human Rights, she reports that in Rio's favelas, entire communities have been affected by exposure to police operations. And this has resulted in a marked increase in cases of deaths from suicide, deaths from excessive consumption of alcohol or drugs, cancer, and also deaths from perfectly treatable diseases. And she argues that this denotes levels of psychological distress with almost epidemic characteristics. And when we were filming right now, I want to screen and in Rio in 2019, community leaders, teachers, civil society, members of those communities told us that coping with the mental health impacts of police violence takes up much of their energy and time. But if you look at police, uh, not police, uh, human rights reports and human rights cases dealing with police violence, the amount of space given to violations of the right to mental health are quite small. Um, before I go on to go into that into more detail, I would like to play a two minute clip from right now, I want to scream, um, where uh, they are talking, uh, the interviewees discuss the impact of violence on children in school. Alain, would you play the clip, please? O calendário escolar para criança pobre, ele é completamente fragmentado o tempo todo, seja a, a, a escola que está dentro da favela ou que está à margem da favela ou que está distante da favela, né? É muito complexo porque num tiroteio dentro da favela acabou aquele dia letivo. Então é um dia que tem que ser riscado do calendário. Muitas das vezes, dependendo de quem é essa criança, de quem é esse profissional, ele perde essa semana, dependendo do grau de violência desse conflito. É um conflito que normalmente é, começa cedo ou pode ser durante o período do dia. Se começa cedo, essa escola não abre, então essa criança já fica sem aula. Ela fica refém desse conflito dentro de casa, com a sua família. Muitas vezes, quando dá para sair, a mãe vai trabalhar, porque o patrão não quer saber disso, e ela fica ali refém né, da sua própria direito de ir e vir, né, de tudo que ele está passando ali mentalmente, sozinho. Essa criança vai viver durante dias em traumas, né, com distúrbio de sono, ouvindo tiros que não está, no mesmo momento de paz, ele vai estar tá ouvindo tiro, a cabeça completamente chocada e traumatizada, porque, de fato, a gente vive uma situação de guerra. A gente tem crianças com depressão, né, que não, não frequentam diariamente as escolas, é, a gente tem escolas que foram invadidas pela polícia em momentos de aula por alguma questão e não tinha nada e essas crianças estão impactadas diretamente. Mas a questão da saúde diretamente, a gente atende mulheres e crianças, casos gravíssimos de depressão, síndrome do pânico, por conta da violência geral. Tiroteio em momento que a criança está indo para a escola, tiroteio quando estão dentro de sala de aula, é, tiroteio no retorno para casa. In this next little bit of my pre presentation, I'm first of, all, first of all going to discuss a little bit on the right to mental health, and then I'm going to talk about the UN's response to police violence, especially against people of African descent, and to draw together some links there. Uh, so the right to mental health, as Ulysses noted in his um, presentation at the beginning of this um, event, uh, Brazil is required by its constitution to ensure high health standards 
for everyone within Brazil without discrimination. In addition, all states, including Brazil, are party to at least one treaty requiring them to respect, pro protect, and fulfill the right to health of everyone within their jurisdiction. And the right to health includes the right to mental health. Human rights experts on the right to health, including successive special rapporteurs, Hunt, Puras, and the current special rapporteur, Tlaleng Mofakeng, and the U committee that monitors the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, they are all clear that the right to health includes the right to its social determinants. That is, the right to health includes not only the right to health care and to treatment when you get sick, but the, the right to an environment that supports your health. And this is particularly important when it comes to the right to mental health, because uh, as psychologists know, and Danius Puras, uh, the former UN Special Rapporteur on the right to health, has repeatedly stated in interviews and also in, in his annual reports that violence um, is one of the key factors in undermining or compromising the right to mental health. And vi violence, police violence is, as its name is clear, that that is violence that can compromise. And there is a high record, as I mentioned earlier, uh, of this violence potentially compromising the right to mental health of residents uh, in the targeted communities, favelas, and also of the police themselves. In April 2021, in her report, uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, Klaleng Mofakeng, she was appointed in 2020, she stated that the right to health encompasses a right to the psychosocial elements that promote individual and social well-being. She also stressed, and I think it's important uh, to, to note what she said here because it's important in targeting, in, a, in looking at ways of uh, raising the profile of what is happening in Rio. She also stressed the importance of the need to, impact, to examine the impact of coloniality and racism on the right to health. And I think that is exactly what is happening in Rio, the impact of coloniality and racism, in particular the history of slavery, uh, on the right to health and the right to mental health in people in the favelas. Because states have a right, uh, have an obligation to protect the right to health of the people in their jurisdiction, and because police violence um, has a clear potential for undermining the right to mental health of the people in the targeted communities, the state must have, it logically follows that they must have an obligation when they're training, planning and conducting policing operations to consider and take into account any substantial evidence produced by community psychologists that these operations may compromise right to mental health of the people living in those communities. I'm just going to move on now to look at the Human Rights Council's response to police violence against people of African descent, which, as I'm sure you all know, has become a major issue since 2020 in response to Black Lives Matter movements and the scale of police violence towards people of African in descent. In 2020, the Human Rights Council adopted Resolution 43-1 on the promotion and protection of human rights of people of African descent against excessive use of force and other human rights violations by law enforcement officers. This would include a broad range of any violations of the rights of, the rights of people of African descent as a consequence of excessive use of force and violence by law enforcement officers, the police, for example. And so it would include violations of the right to mental health of people of African descent as a result of excessive use of force by the police. In her follow-up uh, report to this resolution, UN High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet stated that the experience of living in neighborhoods frequently subjected to heavily militarized policing may be described as like living in conditions similar to war zones. In a follow-up conference paper published at the same time as High Commissioner Bachelet's report, the Human Rights Council said, psychological trauma linked to police violence often extends to whole communities. Each new killing is a reminder of those who came before, resurfacing the pain and trauma related to past killings. Unfortunately, 
There is no mention in the conference paper or in High Commissioner Bachelet's report of the right to mental health. So whilst the report and the conference paper condemn in depth and in detail uh, violence by police, particularly against communities where there is a high population of people of African descent. And they also note that the, this excessive use of force and violence causes psychological trauma broadly throughout the community. It is not being connected to a violation of the right to mental health or potential violation of the right to mental health. And this is important, this gap is important to address because if, it, if you did look beyond just the killings and looked at potential violations of the right to mental health, you could broaden the scale, the, the pool of people who would be considered as direct victims of police violence. And you would also broaden the uh, scale of obligations of the state when they're planning policing operations, because they have to plan not only to avoid directly killing someone, but have to plan their operations in such a way as to protect the right to health, including the right to mental health of the targeted communities. Um, and I should say, as I'm going on, on in this, the reason this came to mind is with interviews with people, uh, Anna Paula and her colleagues, that this, this gap became clear to me. And um, I went uh, to Geneva in November to talk with a number of people from the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, including the people who have assisted Michelle Bachelet in preparing um, her report and the conference paper um, in supporting uh, in support of resolution 43.1. And I wanted to ask them about this. And they told me that when they were preparing High Commissioner Bachelet's report, they were aware of the seriousness of the scale of mental trauma as a result of police violence. It came out in the interviews with uh, their local partners in the countries that are affected. But they said it did not occur to anyone on the Geneva team preparing that report or their local partners in the countries affected to frame the mental health consequences of police violence as potential violations of the right to mental health. That's why the right to mental health is not mentioned in the report. The, the, violence, the, the violence is mentioned and the trauma is mentioned, but it's not framed as a violation of the right to mental health. And they said it simply didn't occur to them to do so. And I assume that the reason it didn't occur to them to do so is because the right to health in particular, the right to mental health is under-researched, it's under-addressed, the spotlight on it is only been emerging in the last five, 10 years or so. Danis Puras, uh, the uh, UN Special Rapporteur from 2014 to 2020, was a leading uh, light in, bring, in raising awareness of it. And Klaaleng Mofakeng is has stated her in, uh, her intention to continue that work, but also to expand it, to focus on uh, the impact of coloniality and racism. And therefore, I think that that, that umbrella, the work of Danius Puris, the work of Alain Mofakeng, and the awareness of the scale of um, mental health, the potential to compromise mental health in communities, opens up a way of looking at um, police violence that is broader than uh, deaths and injuries, because unfortunately deaths and injuries hit the papers, they pass on, but they don't produce radical change in viewing at the way policing should operate in, in the targeted communities, in favela communities, for example, in Rio. And I, I think by looking at the right to mental health, it might be possible both from the by broadening the pool of potential victims and by highlighting the broader scale of obligations of the state to open up ways of discussing how to address policing differently. At least I hope so. It is a gap that I noticed because uh, we all noticed um, when we were producing the film. We noticed it when we were editing the film because we noticed this, the, how much the talk about mental health, trauma, the effect of schools being closed and the effect of children being frightened was discussed by interviewees 
and how little um, interviewees from the community, but and how little this was being addressed by the lawyers that we spoke to. And that became very clear when we were editing. Um, in sum, I think there was a lot of work to do to persuade states of their obligation to take into account human rights when planning and conducting police operations and to persuade them that this includes the right to mental health. But I think this is uh, an important thing, an important aspect of campaigning to uh, protect uh, the human rights of targeted communities. And I also think it's an optimal time uh, for uh, broadening the, the, the way we look at the violations of human rights in, in these circumstances because of the work of Damius Puras, because of the current work of Klaalang Mofakeng, and because of the broadening focus on the right to mental health that is relatively new. And thank you all for listening. Obrigado, professora Siobhan Wills. Thank you, Professor Siobhan Wills. I now pass the word to Ana Paula for her presentation. Good morning to all. Hello. Good morning to everyone participating. I want to thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, it's always difficult for me to speak about police violence and state violence and militarized policing, the mental health of the Brazilian population, because all of this obviously moves me deeply. I am Ana Paula Oliveira. I live in the favela of Manguinhos in Rio de Janeiro. It is a favela in the north zone of the state of Rio, de, of the city of Rio de Janeiro. I am one of the founders of the movement Mães de Manguinhos, a movement of mothers and relatives that of victims of state violence in Rio de Janeiro, people who fight, who battle for rights, for memory, for justice, for liberty, for freedom, but most of all, fight for life, for the right to live. I'm also part of the social forum of Manguinhos, which is a uh, a great partner of ours, of the Mothers of Manguinhos movement, and fights side by side with us. Uh, the social forum of Manguinhos fights side by side, the Mães de Manguinhos, ever since the beginning of this movement. I am also part of a project at Fiocruz currently. So I am a researcher at the Fiocruz project currently. It's a project that has um, given me the opportunity to once again be close to the population in Manguinhos. We have spoken to the population in Manguinhos. We have spoken to the inhabitants about COVID, about memories um, in um, the, this landscape, as well as the limiting situations or the barriers um to life so the years have gone by and problems remain the same this is a barrier the elderly as well as the young in the favelas the people we speak to always report the same problems that the favela faces ever since the beginning of time so more and more flooding um, fires police violence and unemployment, the lack of public policy, in fact, uh, reaching our communities and um, servicing us. So for myself, it has also been a great opportunity to participate in this research group and be part of this project. And I've learned a lot with this. Being here today and speaking about this subject, this, this, this part of our debate is, is important. It's important to speak here today because we have seen more of the same intensified. My son, well, I am Jonathan's mother, the mother of Jonathan Jolivera Lima. He's a 19 year old young man who was murdered by the police in 2014. 
when Munguinhos was being occupied by the pacification policy. So Munguinhos was occupied in 2012 by the project of the UPPs, unit, police pacifying units. The UPPs, when they reached Munguinhos, the pacification units arrived violating the rights of the inhabitants of Munguinhos ever since day one. It was a political project. The UPPs were a political project, also a project which was installed in light of the elections, the same as the project Integrated City is now uh, demonstrating. So a project which is born on an election year and reaches favelas in a very impacts favelas in a very violent way and demonstrates itself to be a continuation of the UPP project. So we see the integrated city um, with a lot of fear because we know that when the favelas are occupied by police agents, there are more violations of human rights taking place. The militarized police, which occupies our neighborhoods, dominate and control. I mean, it's a way of dominating and controlling the bodies of the people that, and the lives of the people living in favelas. So I'm referring to a situation which will impact our livelihoods directly. Yesterday, Professor Ulysses um, got in contact with me to speak about what would be happening today, our debate today, our panel today. And I was very tense at the moment, and I shared with him that I was tense, and um, we woke up yesterday in Manguinhos with the favela totally occupied by the police yesterday. And obviously, this raises our level of anxiety. When this happens, our life becomes paralyzed. A simple walk from your house to the bakery to buy bread is impossible because we uh, we fear for our lives. When we think about walking outside, walking in our neighborhoods, we fear um, being violated on the way to the bakery or, or walking around in our neighborhood. And we also become fearful that when we go out and we come back, our houses will have been invaded. Because unfortunately, that's what a police occupation means in a favela community. We are already hearing reports from yesterday to today um, um, from people in the favelas of Chacarezinho that their houses have been invaded. Yesterday, I saw on social media that the inhabitants of the Chacarezinho favela have gone outside of their houses and put on the doors of their houses signs where they report what their professions are, that they work, that they are workers, and they have written this on carts on paper and put it on their doors, asking, begging, please, I'm a worker, do not invade my house. And they've been writing down their professions, where they work, the addresses of their work, so they can prove that their houses should not be invaded. This is a direct impact of state violence, of militarized policing of our homes, and with um, the way this affects our mental health, which is obviously completely impacted by this scenario of police occupation. And it's not only when there is a slaughter or a murder or a death, our health is impacted, our livelihoods are impacted and our mental health is impacted when we consider that we can't go outside. That's a state of terror and when we consider that our routines cannot take place with peace and calm, we cannot go outside, we can't go to work, kids can't go to, to the park or play on the streets, they can't go to school because of the deep level of fear which becomes installed. So I think that, you know, governments change, political parties change, and they are always using our pain and using our bodies to become elected, to maintain themselves in power, and to create policies of pain and suffering. Obviously, this revolts us 
and this is something which I think needs to be said, needs to be said out loud. We are the people who are directly impacted, who are directly negatively impacted by these policies, these public policies, which are created to directly affect us. We need to um, report, we need to say, we need to denounce this. When we receive reports of this in the Maishi Manguinhos movement, we have uh, lots of people have come to, to speak to us. The mothers of the victims of the Jacarezinho slaughter. We have received many requests for help because that's what happens. They have a political project which is called Integrated City, but eight months ago, one of the biggest slaughters in the history of Rio de Janeiro took place in the exact same favela. And the mothers of those victims of that slaughter, these women, these widows, these mothers are still completely, uh, have been left um, helpless. So they are requesting for help and they're not being heard. They're not being helped. They're not being um, listened to. So what policy is this that is called this policy of the integrated city, which does not include us? We are always left to fend for ourselves. We have to help each other. We have to care for each other. Sometimes um, we are fragmented and in pain, we try to have a minimum strength so that we can reach out to a sister, to a mother, to an aunt that has also lost a loved one. We are the ones left to fend for ourselves because the government, the politicians do not write or create policy, which is truly public, public policy, which in fact takes into consideration the population or which will make a difference or impact or help our lives or offer us any type of support. What we see is public policy which is there to generate more disease, more sickness. One of the mother's victims of the uh, slaughter of Jacarezinho um, told, sent me a message on WhatsApp today telling me that she was awake standing on the corner of her street because she has a store, a small shop, and um, she was reported, she was told that her shop would be closed down. So she told me that she is not sleeping, she's not eating, she's not able to deal with this. And she can't prosper, she can't live with her life because of this constant fear of what will happen to her livelihood. So I'm sharing these, these cases with you so that everybody here can have an idea, have a small notion of how all of this is impacting our lives, how the subject of our debate today impacts the lives of the people living in these situations. The people which inhabit these territories, which are consistently occupied by militarized policing and state violence. We understand state violence not only when homicides or murders take place, but as Monique, Monique said, state violence regarding people who are deprived of freedom, incarcerated populations, state violence when our children cannot go to school, cannot have access to education, cannot live peaceful lives or study in peace without hearing gunshots. State violence when we become sick, when we need a hospital bed and cannot access it. Can't access hospitals or can't access any type of apparatus to support us through trauma. So state violence comes through many different um, means and forms, and this obviously causes us to become sick um, and we are left helpless. Unfortunately, there are not policy, true public policies that are thought of for our mental health, for our the health of our bodies. These policies do not exist. So. I think that's what I wanted to share here today. I'm not sure if my time is up already, if I should speak more. Thank you, Ana Paula. You would have a few minutes left if you want to share more. Well, then I would like to, to, to share one more thing about 
the UPPs, the pacifying police units. Much has been said about the new project, the integrated city project, which will incorporate police agents that already work in the UPPs. So this is something that concerns me greatly. My son was murdered by a police agent from the UPP, from the pacifying police unit. And we know how many murders are caused in the favelas which were occupied by the pacifying police units. All of the favelas in which there were occupation, police occupations, UPP occupations, saw a rise and increase in murders by these police agents. So I think we must be aware of what is taking place, of what this public policy means, of what this occupation means, which is not in any way a new project. It's very much the same as everything that has been brought about in the past. It's a state use of our pain, <clears throat> of our suffering to be a political platform for elections. And this needs to be said, it needs to be reported, it needs to be denounced. That's that's it. That's all I would like to share. Thank you. Thank you, Ana Paula, for your words. We would now go to questions and answers from the audience. We have a few of them here. The first question goes from goes to Ana Paula. Oh, actually, it's a, a question to all, all of the panelists today. So I would like to ask every one of the speakers to take two minutes to answer this question so we could have time for more questions. The first question from Ana Paula, a participant, is here. Let me just locate the question. And the question would be to the three speakers. Which are the paths for broadening or deepening the right to mental health in contexts of urban violence? What are the paths for increasing access, broadening and deepening the right to human to, to mental health in contexts of urban violence? The question is from Ana Paula from the Federal University of Goiás. Moniki, maybe you could please start. And if you have, if you can take two minutes to reflect on that, and then we will go to Professor Siovan and then Ana Paula. So it's difficult to discuss this. I would say that the first path is to question the policy severely. Um, we, not only myself as a researcher and academic, but Justicia Global in its 22 years of action has been questioning these policies public policies and the selective nature of the application of the public policy. So before discussing the effects of armed violence, we should discuss territorial control, the barbarous territorial control, which the state of Brazil applies in favelas. And then following that, we should implement policy of mental health, mental health policies for these communities uh, in a way that actually impacts positively impacts the mental health. In the case of Manguinhos, for many years in Brazil, Fiocruz, I mean, how many years has it taken for the policy, the health policy of the family to consider the impact of armed violence in people's lives and how this affects their mental health and thus their physical health as well. So thinking about how we direct public resources. So for example, we have spaces where millions of reais are dedicated uh, on a yearly basis to public health. For example, the budgets for 2022, in the budget for 2022, public health, uh, no, public security is only um, behind public health. And so question where we're directing the resources, um, how we can recognize the policies that exist in the territories, especially in the city of Rio de Janeiro, how these policies have worked. Uh, let's say the ones that have worked reasonably, I wouldn't say that they're, you know, working very well, but the reasonable policies need to be strengthened, question public investment in, arm, in arms, um, death and militarized policing, and as well as creating spaces where we can discuss how these policies are directed at producing death and how we can redirect policy to policy that is positive. Um, some policies may already exist in some cases that could be strengthened. Siobhan? Um, 
I think, um, well, there are many different ways I'll, put, um, I'll focus as my field is human rights law on, um, on looking from the perspective of human rights law. I think there's, uh, depending on your field and where you're working, there'll be different ways of approaching this. But I think from a human rights law perspective, uh, highlighting uh, the right to mental health in the context of militarized policing and police violence uh, is key to uh, raising its uh, raising its importance at a practical level, and that can be done two ways: highlighting it both at the local level um, in communities and um, uh, NGO organisations and local lawyers on raising awareness of the issue that um, police violence and militarised policing has a broad impact, and the occupations of communities has a broad impact on the right to mental health can potentially, and there is powerful evidence from psychologists that it does compromise the mental health of people living in uh, targeted communities. For local uh, lawyers, NGOs to raise that and raise it consistently, and also at uh, international level for UN special rapporteurs and for uh, UN delegates um, to uh, at the uh, Office of the High Commission of Human Rights to raise it as an issue and for uh, committee members on when they make comments on uh, treaties to raise the issue of the right to mental health in the context of police violence and militarized policing. And there is opportunity to do this, this in the coming time. Uh, Tlaleng Mofaken, who is the U new UN Special Rapporteur on the right to mental health, on the right to health broadly. She, her next report, which she is intends to publish in June 2020, focuses on, the, on violence and health. So it seems clear that there is an opportunity there when she is focusing on violence, her, her focus is broad, not just on police violence or state violence, but all kinds of violence on health. But there is an opportunity there to draw attention to the impact of police violence on mental health. And then again, in um, I think in September, the UN, uh, the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights is holding a dialogue. Um, it's part of the, they usually hold dialogues um, with states uh, regarding violations of human rights. But this dialogue will be different. It's focusing on violations of human rights of people of African descent uh, as a result of police violence or excessive use of police force. And for the first time ever, the UN intends to open up that dialogue directly to, um, to victims and groups in, uh, in communities where they are experiencing such violence. So it is an opportunity for uh, victims and victims groups to directly address the UN. I'm not sure of the date yet, but I know it's September of this year. So I think those are some ways that we could um, try and raise awareness of the issue. Aduna Paula. Oi, é, desculpa, Felice, você pode repetir a pergunta? I'm sorry, uh, could you please repeat the question, Professor Ulysses? Yes, of course. Which are the ways or the paths to broaden and deepen the right to mental health in context of urban violence? I would say that, as Moniki also mentioned, I think the main way is to think of public policies, to think and create public policies that are policies directed at care and not policies of violence. I think that is the way forward. Usually public policy of public security is a policy which does not reach us in any way. It's not a policy of care, it's a policy which imprisons us, which makes us sick and which kills us eventually. So I would say that the first step forward is to rethink the basis of the public policy so we can think of public policy that cares for us and does not make us sicker. Thank you, I would say that's that's a, a path forward. Thank you, I have a question specific for each speaker now, starting with Moniki. This question goes to Professor Moniki, to Speaker Moniki. So it says, how do, does the organization of initiatives like Mainz Jumanginus, has the state supported Mainz Jumanginus? Another question from Anapala from the Federal um, University of Goiás about how the state reacts to movements like Mainz Jumanginus. So I can answer a bit about this because I'm from the forum of Manginus and uh, then I would pass the, question, the rest of the question to Anapala. But, Justicia Global has been monitoring some of the social movements in Brazil for a few years, especially the national movement 
uh, national movements of um, mothers reacting to, to the state violence. The state has in no way supported these movements. To the contrary, these movements have been fundamental for producing democracy or the, the little democracy that is left in Brazil currently. But these movements have been reacting to public policy and making requests to the public ministry, which we believe the public ministry in Brazil, public prosecutor, uh, public defender's office has uh, omitted itself in its role of external control and has also caused many decisions being made in favor of state violence. So we believe the state has become, has uh, ignored these issues. Movements have also been very important in being resistant toward this state omission but it's self-organization. The state, to the contrary, does not support these movements. And I would like to highlight this internationally. This Brazilian state has been internationally um, reported in international organisms of human rights for criminalizing human rights, especially social movements of mothers, of victims, and movements which are organized in the anti-prison movement. So the environmental environment, right? the environment right now is very well known and um, uh, um, we have heard, but something that has been hasn't been stated enough is the impact of these um, movements on the if battle against state terrorism thank you moniki the question would now be to Sioban also from the from luciano Cassio from the federal organization in Guayas. in your perception does the legalization of drugs, of tr sales, of uh, uh, drug trade, which is today considered illegal, um, could this help to decrease violence in the favelas of Brazil, legalizing drugs which are currently illegal? Um, probably. Um, I, I, I'm not, I would be hesitant, um, I, as I haven't researched um, policy is on, um, on what you should do about drug control, I'd be hesitant of giving a clear cut answer on that because I'm stretching out of my field. And uh, uh, so I would be nervous about a clear answer, but I, I definitely think the policy on um, drug control is mistaken and it is uh, contributing to violence and it is not helping in any way at all. So I think there needs to be a reform of that policy, exactly how that should be reformed, whether it should be legalization different entirely. Um, I certainly think that probably um, support for, for drug users rather than murdering them would be um, obviously a, a better approach to me. Um, but whether or not uh, legalization is the right route, I don't know because I'm not an expert on the I haven't been involved in researching the exact impact of uh, legalization of drugs, but a change in policy is definitely needed. Thank you. Luciano also asks to Ana Paula if she could speak about this, if she could speak about drug control and if legalization of currently uh, illegal drugs would help um, to decrease violence in these communities. He also asks Ana Paula to talk about how you articulate as Mães de Manguinhos, how the movement is organized, how it articulates, articulates and how you support mothers of victims through your movement. Yes, I agree with um, Siobhan when she says that this drug policy, in fact, needs to be reformed, transformed, modified, uh, the way things are being carried out don't go well. But I think above all, what we need to do is face racism. Because even if there is a, another way of treating drugs, uh, even if drugs are legalized, we know that they will use other excuses to continue slaughtering our poor, black and uh, favela based population so we can't just legalize drugs we need to do consider drug policy in the framework of fighting and facing racism we know that brazil is a country which kills which incarcerates its people of color its afro-descendant population so i think that we need to reform drug policy deeply 
I, I, I do believe reform is necessary, but because a drug user who is black is considered a drug dealer and a white person with the same amount of drugs or using those drugs, holding the exact same amount of drugs as uh, the black person will be treated as a user, as someone who deserves care, as someone who needs to be medicated, treated. And a young black man from the favela with the same amount of drugs will not be treated that way or seen by society that way. He is seen and or she will be seen as a drug dealer by this society. And we know that And most of the people in prisons in Brazil are young black men who many times were even framed, um, black, poor, young men who many times were framed, many times they were not even holding the drugs, but they were framed as having held those drugs. Many times people who were uh, arrested with a minimum quantity of drugs that they were using for their own consumption, but are responding or are serving, doing prison jail time and being considered for doing jail time as if they were drug dealers. So yes, I think drug policy needs to be transformed, but it needs to be done <laughs> with a special care or outlook towards the racist, the structural racism, and we need to understand that they will always look for new reasons to incarcerate us, to imprison us, and to combat our bodies, because this society is deeply racist, and you know, new excuses would be found. So that's my opinion about um, drug policy. Now, how about how women have articulated, how the women and mothers who are victims of state violence have articulated nationally and internationally one of the ways we have found is through, uh, for example, participating in a documentary like this very important film, which was Now I Want to Scream. That is one of the ways in we articulate and organize and make our voices heard. And that is our desire to scream to the world about the violence, which is um, which our bodies are facing, all of the violations of our human rights. Uh, and I think this is one of the ways that we are able to speak about this. So, you know, when we talk about the way this will strengthen or how we can strengthen our movement, that is one way, participating in documentaries, live streams, contributing to the debate. That is one of the ways we are heard. That is one of the ways we articulate. And we also try to increase the political training as we bring, as we care for these women who are victims of violence, because they need to be, they need to understand why that violence reached their child or their relative. It's not by chance. They need to understand the structural nature of that violence. Well, um, thank you. We are reaching the end of our event. I have one last question to the three speakers. This would be our last round. Um, how is it that organized civil society can work to demand from the Brazilian state that it, uh, that it in fact, um, apply its responsibility of respecting, obeying, and um, upholding the rights to health and mental health and human rights in the, the favela communities. Let's cons let's follow the same order. I think Anna can talk more specifically about the community of Manguinhos, but I'll tell you a little bit about what we have seen in most of Brazil. So it's very difficult for us to think about how we can ob obligate the Brazilian state to fulfill its obligations, considering that the Brazilian state has disobeyed its um, tr international treaties and um, international and national obligations in general. This has been reported consistently. The women and mothers of victims have gathered, they have met, besides giving public visibility to this to this issue. They have sat with the UN, they have sat with different forums of human rights, they have participated with meetings of UN women to deal with these issues and have specifically brought up the case of mental health. Unfortunately, the Brazilian state has not complied with its obligations, constitutional obligations. There have been not no doors opened or possible paths for dialogue. We have a parliament which is today very 
racist, misogynist, and homophobic, this makes it very difficult to implement and um, a direct policy human rights to human rights. But I think that in broadening this debate and stretching it to those who are directly impacted could help to organize public civil or civil society organization. And also it's important to remember, I think Anna Paula can also talk about this. She works with MAPAVI. I don't remember what the acronym means, but MAPAVI is a group of psychologists, social care workers that work with mental health of victims of state violence in Brazil. They have fundamentally worked to care for um, victims of state violence. And I think Ana Paula can probably touch on how they have helped the mothers of Manguinhos. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much for everyone who has been with us this morning. Siobhan, please. It would be the, the strength of victims groups and civil society in Rio in particular is, is very powerful. And I wouldn't have any advice as to how those groups um, should campaign per further because I think they're doing uh, uh, their work is excellent and they and they and it comes from the pain that they are suffering. I think um, unfortunately they are uh, struggling against a government which is appallingly oppressive. Um, that is internationally recognised as well as in Brazil, um, and so um, I think it does the victims groups do need to harness the support of the international community in order to be able to change the government because the well, not change the government but even to try and uh, put pressure on the government um, and so I think working together is um, probably the ideal way of, of it's something they're already doing but continuing doing that and pushing further and highlighting further and on the particular topic of today the right to mental health I think highlighting that explicitly because when I went to Geneva, um, the the all, and I spoke to about six people from the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and they all said that in their next report, they would format, um, frame the issues of trauma as a result of police violence, as a violation of the right to mental health or a potential violation of the right to mental health, because that expands the, the legal ways of challenging police violence. It gives another layer to do so. And I think, uh, if they do that, then it's important that civil society also raises that issue, as well as, of course, all the other human rights violations, including, of course, the core human rights violation, was, which is the violation of the right to life. But it is more pervasive because it's an occupation of, it isn't, it's an occupation of whole communities. It's a, a destruction of a way of life. It's, as Anna Paula has said, it's, it's, and Monica as well, well as said, it's a targeted destruction of communities because they are black. Um, I think that that needs to, to be addressed. And that for, the UN is aware of that as a result of police violence, that that is happening. That is an international issue now. So even though it is very slow and fragile, there is some thin window perhaps of trying to push further. Thank you. Ana Paula, please. Uh, I agree. I think it's a movement which, as I, I have said this before, and I would like to repeat it again, uh, it can't be a fight only of the mothers of victims, only of the relatives. It's too heavy a burden for us to carry on our own. It can't be a fight only of victims of violence. All of society needs to become engaged with this, needs to understand this as a deep injustice. We're talking about the right to life mainly here. And, and I think that that's the most important point. Many times we, we're here, we're raising our voices. We are screaming and we are not heard by our country, by our state, by our governments. Many times this call needs to come from abroad so that something can happen. Also, unfortunately, I see that in Brazil, our society is usually mobilized or moved more 
with something that happens internationally than what is happening in Brazil. Brazilian lives, I would say, are less valued. So deaths in our country are less shocking than deaths abroad. And I've, I like to give this example because I noticed this when George Floyd was murdered. A black man was murdered also by the police in the United States. And we saw that the Brazilian uh, you know, Brazilian society claimed for his life. We saw artists um, posting on social media about this, and we saw celebrities talking about this. And I, I'm not in any way disagreeing that this should not, that this should have happened. But what happens is that the police in Brazil are killing black people every day in our country, especially in the city of Rio de Janeiro. And we don't see the same a movement. We don't see the celebrities, the artists engaging with the subject or civil society as a whole protesting these deaths. So there is a clear value put on life there. Uh, we don't see the social media movement happening. I wanted to understand why. Why is it easier to be moved by something that happens on the other side of the world or in the United States thing that we right here see this happening on the daily and it seems to be a a fight that is only of the favela or only of the people who are directly impacted by this so i i also want to raise my voice and request society as a whole civil society as a whole to join our fight because i, th I believe it's a fight that it belongs to all of us Thank you very much, Ana Paula, for your words. Given uh, the schedule, we will have to move to our uh, closing. I do want to start by giving you a few announcements. The link to the film, Now I Want to Scream, was made available in the chat. It will be um, open during the month of, of January. Please feel free to watch and share the link on your social media. I would also like to thank the post-graduation program in human rights uh, of UFG, the research group in human rights and, and public policy of URG, uh, Ulster University as well, and all of you who have come been a part of this conversation. I want to specifically thank Professor Magno Medeiros, who is the coordinator of the human rights <clears throat> channel on YouTube. On this channel, we will make this presentation available, recorded, you can watch it again as you need or share the link to other people you think might have interest. I would also like to thank Alan very much for his um, uh, contribution. He was responsible for the tech, the Zoom tech. I want to thank Jim Machado also, who was um, helped share the event, made the folder. I want to thank Clara for the translation and the simultaneous translation, which has been very um, positive. I want to thank the speakers, Siobhan, um, Ana Paula Oliveira, and Moniki. And I also want to say that we, who are professors, researchers, and academics in the area of human rights, this is our mission as well. We need to bring arguments to the table so that you, who are resisting, who are creating movements, who are fighting against the state which violates our rights and uh, we need to offer you support. If not directly to the fight, we have to indirectly offer our support through producing knowledge about this. So Ana Paula, Moniki, um, I want to repeat that we are here if you need anything. I, I have a, a relationship with Justicia Global and Mainji Manguinhos, but we are all available if you need help. Um, you are not alone and let's continue strengthening this network and fighting for justice. So keep fighting for human rights. Brazil needs you. Brazil needs your fights. Um, we will be standing by you to support you. Thank you all for coming and um, stay safe. And with that, we close the event today. Thank you all. Thank you. Goodbye.